said the little tiger. We have everything we want here and nothing to be afraid of because we're friends with everybody. Isn't that right, Bear? You bet, said the little bear. I never have to bellow like a bear and you never have to roar like a tiger, but we don't mind. Every day the little bear went fishing down at the river and the little tiger went into the forest to look for mushrooms. Tigers are all thumbs in the kitchen, so the little bear did most of the cooking. Mm, would you like your fish with salt and lemon, Mr. Tiger, or would you prefer it with pepper and onion? Both ways, I think, said the little tiger. And in very great quantity. They hadn't a care in the world. Then one day, an old crate came floating down the river. <laughs> hmm. Bananas, said the little bear with delight. pa no ma he read. This crate comes from Panama, and Panama spells like bananas. And as of right now, Panama is the land of my dreams. He went straight home and told the little tiger all about Panama until well past their bedtime. In Panama, he said, everything is much nicer because Panama smells like bananas from top to bottom. Panama is the land of our dreams, tiger. We must set out for Panama first thing in the morning. At the crack of dawn, piped the little tiger. But I'll only go on one condition, Bear, that my tiger ducky comes, too. The next morning, they got up much earlier than usual. Since we don't know the way, said the little bear, we are going to need a sign to follow. So they took apart the old crate and built a signpost. <clears throat> now that they had a sign to follow, the little bear led the way along the riverside. Before long, they met a mouse. Hello, mouse, said the little bear. We are off to Panama. Everything is much better there and much bigger, too. It can't be any bigger than my mouse hole, snorted the mouse. <laughs> Hardly worth the effort. Bah. What do mice know about Panama? Nothing, if not less. When they met the sly fox, he was just sitting down with a goose to celebrate his birthday. Excuse me, 
Would you know the way to Panama? Asked the little bear. It's somewhere off to the left there, said the fox without thinking. He really didn't want to be disturbed. A rather sleepy looking cow agreed with the fox. Mmm! Panama must be that way, because the other way, there, is where my barn is, and it's at the end of the world. Mm -mm. They should have known better than to ask a cow for directions, but they pushed on to the left nonetheless. The trouble with always going left is that you end up going around in a circle without even knowing it. Anyhow, before they'd gone much further, they met a hare and a porcupine, bringing in their harvest. We welcome any travelers with news of the world, said the hare. Come home with us and rest your weary feet. At the home of the hare and the porcupine, all the little bear could talk about was Panama. He and the little tiger had even been allowed to sit on the comfy sofa. A comfy sofa, declared the little tiger, is the most wonderful thing in the world. We're going to buy one the instant we get to Panama. Then we'll have everything we'll ever need, right? Right, agreed the little bear. Oh, to think, he sighed, that soon we'll be sitting on a comfy sofa in Panama, where it smells like bananas all day and all night. We've never gone further than the end of our field, said the hare. This farm was the land of our dreams because it was home and gave us our food. But from now on, our dreamland is Panama. Panama's paradise, right, porcupine? That night, all four of them had sweet dreams about Panama. The next morning, they continued to their left and came to a broad river. We must go and look for some wood, said the little bear. And then he built them a sturdy raft. I'm honored, said the little tiger, to have a friend who knows how to build a raft, especially since I'm not at all fond of swimming. They launched the raft and floated across to the other side of the river. Feeling quite proud of himself, the little bear took the lead as they set out once more to the left. Stick with me, tiger, and I'll get us to Panama in no time. I'm behind you all the way, chirped the little tiger, and the little bear bore left along the river until they came to a small bridge. Spring floods had torn one of the bridge's planks loose. It was lying in the river. We'll have to repair the bridge, said the little tiger. You take the plank from the bottom, and I'll take the plank from the top. But don't let my tiger ducky fall in. And so they continued their leftwards journey. Not far from the bridge, they met a crow. I hope crows are smarter than cows, said the little bear, getting frustrated. And he asked the crow which road to take. Ah! Which road? Asked the crow. There are hundreds and thousands of roads. Ah! But only one to Panama, retorted the little bear. I know I've seen it somewhere said the crow, and he promised to take a look. He flapped his powerful wings and flew higher and higher with the little bear in hot pursuit. Pull me up, bear, cried the little tiger. If I fall, I'll break my tiger ducky. Now that you're here, crowed the crow. See for yourself. And with a sweep of his wing, he indicated the majestic landscape below. Oh, gasped the little tiger. It's so beautiful, isn't it, bear? More beautiful than anything I've ever seen in my whole entire life, agreed the little bear. Of course, what they were seeing was nothing new, just the river and the countryside. But they had never seen it from so high up before. Oh, I think I see Panama, cried the little tiger. Come on! Let's go! There, when we get to Panama, let's find a big white tree that puffs smoke and build a cozy little house right next door. They hadn't searched for very long when, lo and behold, they came across a signpost lying in the grass. See what it says, Tiger? Let's see. Pa! Pa! Wrong. Pan. Pa 
cakes. No, you dunderhead. Pa, na, ma, Panama. Tiger, we were in Panama, the land of our dreams. And they danced and cheered, convinced they had reached Panama at last. <laughs> Further on, they came to an old house with a white chimney. Oh, Tiger, a beautiful little house, and it's right next door to a big white tree. Oh, we'll have it puffing smoke in no time. Oh, doesn't it look cozy, Tiger? Bubbled the little bear. Let's take a look. The wind and the rain had done their work so thoroughly that they didn't even recognize their own home. With no one to tend them, the trees and bushes had grown much bigger. Everything is bigger here, cried the little tiger. Panama is wonderful. I love it already. They went to work fixing up the house. Together, they patched the roof, built a table and two chairs, and repainted the beds. Then they weeded the garden and planted a whole new assortment of flowers and plants. The little bear went fishing. The little tiger gathered mushrooms. And to top it all off, they went out and bought the comfiest, comfy sofa they could lay their hands on. Now the little house in the wood was the coziest in all creation, again. Oh, tiger, sighed the little bear happily. Panama is everything we hoped it would be, isn't it? Yes, agreed the little tiger. It's the land of our dreams, and we'll never leave it ever again. Do you think all that traveling was worth it? Do you think they should have just stayed home in the first place? Oh, no. They'd never have met the fox or the crow. In fact, they'd never have met the hare and the porcupine. And if they hadn't met them, they'd never have known the deep, blissful tranquility of a truly comfy, comfy sofa. Uh, it's about a special house, a, a big, huge house with ten rooms, maybe even twenty, uh, more, hundreds maybe, uh, thousands, millions of them, yep, uh, and I too. Uh, to the sky. It was the biggest house you've ever seen. Um, the house of a thousand rooms is what it's called. <laughs> One day, Schnoodleboodle had an idea. I'm gonna build a house. You wanna help me? <laughs> Which meant, yes. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> Just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. <laughs> I'll get the saw, and some nails, a can of paint, and you'll need a brush. We'll need some rope, too. Good thinking. Then we should be ready to start. Over there. That looks like a good spot for it. It's high. The view from up there should be really nice. <laughs> when you've got your own house, you can make just as much noise as you want. Isn't that great? <laughs> Aren't you excited, Schnadello? Ah, <sighs> oh, sure am, but it's not built yet. We've still got a lot of work ahead of us. First, I'll get us a ladder. Then we'll be ready to start. First, a house needs strong foundations. He's right. It's got to withstand wind or storm. All kinds of storms. <laughs> Rainstorms and thunderstorms. And snowstorms? <laughs> yes, we get the picture. It's going to be such a terrific house, Schnadello. Nice and strong. I can't wait till it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> 
Finally, Schnoodle Boodle's house was finished. I thought I painted a nice blue. Would you like that? It looks really nice. Except... Oh, there's no room for me. And so, they built a room for Schnoodle Horsey. Now I've got a room all my own. <laughs> Schnoodle Horsey was thrilled. I'm going to paint it pink, because that's my favorite color. Now the house had two rooms, a blue one and a pink one. It really was a nice looking house, but they weren't finished. Schnoodleboodle had another idea. What this house needs now is a music room. After we build it, we can buy a piano and we can play it as loud as we want. You could play on it too. How about it? Oh, yeah. And I could play the walls of the honey flowers. <laughs> they all went back to work. They got some more wood. Some more paint, extra nails, and support beams. With Canary acting as foreman, Schnoodleboodle and his construction crew soon finished the music room, which they painted green. The Schnoodle house now had three rooms. A blue schnoodle boodle room, a pink schnoodle horsey room, and a green music room. We forgot a bathroom. Yes, that's what we need. A place where we can play in the back. And I need a workroom for sawing wood and storing my tools. And how about building a room for my honey bucket? What do you say? <laughs> it shouldn't take too long to build it. The house was growing. Okay. Then we'll need a room with a balcony for the rabbit cage. And we'll need a guest room. And don't forget, we need a tower room, too. They sure had their work cut out for them. They started with a bathroom. Then they added a work room. And a room for Snoodle Horsey's bucket. And a room with a balcony a room for the rabbit cage. Next, they built on a guest room. And last, but not least, a tower room for the lookout. Schnoodle Boodle still wasn't satisfied. It's not finished yet. We still need a treasure room for our money. And, uh, we've got to have a bird room for Canary. Then, we've got to build a rooftop garden room penthouse. And, uh, oh, let's see. That's it, a cloud in the sky room. Then, uh, a helicopter pad room. Schnoodleboodle was starting to run out of ideas. So Schnoodle Horsey got the wood, the paint, and the nails. Hook the ladder onto the rope. I need it to climb up even higher. That's good. Schnoodle Boodle painted the treasure room gold. He made the canary's bird room yellow. And the penthouse garden room red. When was it all going to end? That's nice work. You must be just about finished. What more do you need? But Schnoodleboodle still wasn't satisfied. Now we start the TV room. And after that, we'll build a pie in the sky room. 
a rooftop restroom, and a stargazing room. Let's see, what do I build next? Was there anything left? <laughs> Fortunately, we'll never know. Before Schnoodle Doodle could come up with any more bright ideas, his house of a thousand rooms collapsed. nothing to eat because she hadn't gone out to work in the fields to grow food to store for later. She hadn't done any knitting so she had no gloves to wear and she hadn't built a winter home with a fireplace. So she went to see the beetle to ask for help. You have a cozy little cottage here with more than you need for yourself. Could I stay with you for the winter? I have nowhere to go, said the cricket. The winter is cruel and I forgot to prepare for it. Ah, uh, forgot, eh? Gloated the beetle. You forgot. Oh, yes, I've heard that tune. You fiddle away your summer playing your violin there. And now you want to scrounge for me. Well, I'm sorry, my dear. You're out of luck. The cricket tucked her violin under her arm and went on her way. Soon she came to the home of the mouse. The mouse lived in an abandoned watering can. He had gathered so much food for the winter that there was enough to keep three people fat for four winters. It's only temporary, the cricket was saying. For this winter only. I would have prepared myself, but... but I forgot to and... Oh, forgot! Snapped the mouse. You forgot. Oh, yes. That has a familiar ring to it. You sawed away on your fiddle there all summer long, and now I am expected to support you all winter long on the fruits of my labor. Is that it? No, I'm sorry, my dear. That will never do. The cricket trudged on through the deepening snow until she came to the home of the old mole. 
He lived in a cozy little coal bucket with central heating. Ah, a visitor, he exclaimed. Come a little closer so I can get a good look at you. I don't see too well, you see. Hardly at all, in fact. That's because I spend most of my time underground. That's where I work. Come here, my dear. When he realized his visitor was none other than the cricket, he was delighted. During the summer, he had heard her making her beautiful music. And to a mole who can hear much better than he can see, music is the most beautiful thing in the world. Won't you play a little tune for me, please? Begged the mole. And the cricket played like she'd never played before. And the mole was in heaven. Afterwards, they made a hearty turnip stew and sat down to the first good meal the cricket had had in weeks. Later on, they sat on the sofa and read the forest newspaper together. They laughed at the comics and talked about the weather and didn't argue about politics once. as if it had only been a single day. And they were both very happy, perhaps the happiest they'd ever been in their entire lives. Oh, nice, huh? Huh? Oh, my cue. He buzzed by to, to remind me that my next story has to do with aviation, flight. In fact, it's about a man named, um, named, uh, Popoff, who, who can fly in the sky without wings, hmm? without a plane. Yeah. <laughs> Far off in the golden land of margarine, nestled against the edge of a great forest, sits a humble little cottage. It's so old that the rafters creak even though the roof isn't heavy. In fact, it's only made of straw. On sunny days, the plaster cracks and falls, and the windows are black with soot. An old man lives here. His name is Popoff. In the olden days, Popoff was as strong as two grizzly bears. As he grew older, his strength diminished, but he was still crafty as a fox and a friend to all animals everywhere. He could even speak to them in their own languages and was often called upon to act as an interpreter. In this case, some bees would like to send a message to Popoff's star boarder, a saffron-throated Prululu. Pree hoo hoo hoo, roo doo doo doo, Prululu. Which was simply to say, wake up sleepyhead. The lilacs have opened down by the stream that runs through the valley, and the last one there is a slippery slug. The little Prululu had been Popoff's closest friend for years. In fact, he was the one who taught Popoff how to fly. Oh yes, and I'll tell you the story of how that came about right now. One evening, Popoff was lying down on his bed of straw. 
He had already pulled off his boots. His pants were hanging on a nail in the roof beam, and the window was open. Suddenly, someone with a very sharp beak tapped him on the shoulder. Hey, you. Who? You. Me? Yes, you. Oh, it's you. It was a little Prululu. Popoff had watched him build his nest under the eaves of his cottage, but as yet the little bird hadn't introduced himself. Come with me. Who? Where? You. Up there, to the castle. What castle? The one up there in the sky. Popoff knew about the castle in the sky, all right. On sunny summer days, he'd glance up and catch a fleeting glimpse of a magnificent castle floating in the blue. But it's up in the air, retorted old Popoff. And I can't fly. Fly? Fly? There's nothing to flying. Anyone can fly, once they've learned how. Step outside. And so, the little Pululu taught him how to fly. Popoff got up on the bench beside his front door. Scrunch up your shoulders, tilt your head to the right for takeoff, now blink your eyes, elbows at your sides, and make your fingertips go flippity flap. His feet lifted gently off the bench, and slowly he began to rise. Lift your elbows a little, you're too stiff. He made a left turn, a little clumsily, but not bad for an old man. And at a sensible speed, they floated along above the treetops, the Prululu in the lead, and Popoff close behind. Over here! Here! The little Prululu landed softly on a treetop and waited for Popoff to join him. Popoff hovered over the branch. Relax your shoulders. Good. Rest your palms on the wind and let your body sink. Popoff did as he was told and descended slowly to touch down gently on the branch beside the little Prululu. Being barefoot, he was able to get a firm grip on the branch with his toes, which of course is why birds never wear shoes. Above them gleamed the castle in the sky. They're lighting the candles. As the Prululu took off, he signaled to pop off with his wing. Come, come! It was the perfect time of day for flying. No air pockets or sudden gusts of wind. Just a warm, steady updraft that wafted Popoff up, up towards the castle. They were there in no time. As is the rule with all castles in the sky, the walls were purest crystal. So they could see right into the candlelit room. Old Popoff's head began to swim. It wasn't all the gold and silver or the number of servants that muddled his brain. It was the 12 princesses that sat around the table. The first was beautiful. The second was more so. And the third even more so. And on it went around the table, each more beautiful than the last. And the more he looked, the more beautiful they became. And the more beautiful they became, 
the more he looked. Poor Pop-Pop was in another world. Meantime, a servant had spotted Pop-Pop and his little companion. He approached the old king, who was sitting a little aside from his daughters, on a magnificent throne made of solid gold. There are two gentlemen perched on the windowsill, sire. Is there any message? Mm -hmm. Tell them to come in. Mm. Uh, seat them next to my daughters. Mm. What do they look like? One is quite small, with a long nose. And the other is quite large, with a very nice mustache. Oh, hmm. uh, seat the small gentleman beside me, huh? And oh, the large one hmm, next to Pia. And if they wish, uh, they can marry them tomorrow. One Mia, and the other Pia. But alas, they heard no more. Pop-Pop was so overwhelmed, he tumbled backwards right off the ledge. He dropped like a stone. His loyal friend, the Prululu, dove after him instantly and tried to slow his descent as he cried, Spread your arms, Pop-Pop. You must fly. Fly. As soon as Pop-Pop spread his arms and rested his palms on the wind, he began to glide to a halt. And before long, he came to rest on a beech tree, safe and sound. He called us gentlemen, gentlemen, sighed the Prululu. Can you believe it? Oh, this is the happiest day of my life, it truly is. Do you think they noticed? Groaned Papa. What? What? But I wasn't wearing any pants. He called us gentle, gentlemen, gentlemen, sighed the Prululu once more. I've never had a king call me a gentleman before. A real king. No pants, wailed Popoff. I can't get married in my nightshirt. But in the morning, I'll fly back to the castle, all dressed first thing. Being called a gentleman tastes better than three fat, juicy worms right after a thunderstorm. Uh, did you like Mia? Like her? Of course. But how can I marry her? I already have a wife. She lives with me in the nest. And then they flew home. The Prululu went straight to his nest. And Popoff went straight to bed. And he dreamed of the beautiful Mia. But alas, he never saw her again. For the next morning, the castle had vanished. But still, he had learned how to fly. My song's about a tiger who's falling down all over, who's falling down all over, a poor little jungle tiger who's hurt and just can't walk, who's hurt and just can't walk. That's what this next story's all about. A little tiger hurt and the bear who says to him, I'll care for you. He just came hobbling out of the forest one day, a poor little tiger. You could tell right away there was something wrong. He just fell to the ground. He couldn't walk anymore. When the bear came along, he couldn't even stand. What's the matter with you, Stripes? Hmm? You sick? Oh, yes. I'm really sick. I'm so sick I can't even walk. <laughs> Don't worry. 
I'm here now. You just tell me where it hurts, and I'll fix you up, huh? Here. He pointed to his right paw, then his left one. I'm here, and this foot hurts, and this one too. It hurts here, and here, it hurts everywhere. Oh, hurting all over. Oh dear, I'll have to carry you then. The bear took him to his house. You got to bandage me up. Yeah, right. Never fear, Dr. Bear's here. And off he went. Do this paw first. The bear bandaged the first paw. Then there was the other one to do. There. Well, you feeling any better? Oh, it's my back. The caring bear went back to work again. He carefully wrapped two bandages around the sick tiger's body, binding not just the back, but the chest as well. Around and around he went with the bandages. Not my head. In case I need to cough. <coughs> the bandages were working. The little tiger was feeling better already. Until he took a turn for the worse. He had the hungries. Ooh, I'll cook up something good for you, huh? What's your favorite meal in the whole wide world? I love trout with almond sauce and little baby potatoes rolled in parsley. Hmm, mm, I don't think I have that. Is there anything else? I like egg noodles with almond sauce and parsley. Fresh out of that, too. Is there anything you'd like instead? You got parsley? But the bear was all out of parsley. Um, uh, how about some soup? It'll be good for you. I'd like some soup. And strawberries for my dessert. The bear cooked up some delicious homemade soup for the little tiger. He even put in fresh potatoes and carrots from his garden. The little tiger lapped up his lunch. Delicious. He looked better already. What now? The little tiger was tired. I have to get some sleep. I'm going to bed now. I'll just take these pillows and the leopard blanket. Within minutes, the little tiger was sound asleep. Such a cute little guy. He'll feel much better when he wakes up. Ah, nice and rested. He felt a lot better. Uh-oh, now what's the problem? I think he'd like some company. Sure what? No sooner said than done. Huh? What's the matter with him? You got the flu? I'm sick, Robert. We don't know what it is. We should take him to the doctor. Give Doc Bed a call. There's a good idea. Uh-huh. He's at the animal hospital. I'll make an appointment to see him in the morning. Tomorrow? Uh-huh. Yep. Just knowing he was going to the animal hospital made the little tiger feel better. He knew they'd take good care of him there. 
just so he wouldn't worry. The bear slept with the little tiger. That made him feel safe. They woke up bright and early the next morning. Stripes, as the caring bear called him, was feeling so much better that they took off his bandages. But then he felt worse again. He wanted to go to the animal hospital. The hospital attendants brought a stretcher to carry him there. Sometimes they do that when you're sick. Be careful not to drop him. I don't want anything happening to him. He's not just a sick tiger. He's my friend. He even brought the leopard blanket along. On their way, they ran across a big, kindly elephant. Huh? What happened to him? An accident? No, he's just sick. We don't know why. We're going to find out. Ah, you're going to the hospital. How come? You might need me. They all continued on their way to the animal hospital. Everyone they ran into wanted to go with them. The duck, the rabbit and the mouse, the lion, mad dog, the hedgehog and the donkey. All were worried about little tiger. to walk before we get there. It's a long trek. You made it. Look, there it is. Straight ahead. That's the animal hospital. Put him in room number five. A real no-nonsense nurse. But she was a good goose all the same. A hospital's a busy place. There was already a fox in room number five. Come right in, guys. What happened to you? Mm, you look like a real mess. Fine. Uh, with the lion. I want it. He's really a mess. <laughs> yep. <laughs> a mess. <laughs> That was not true. There was no lion and no fight. He got hurt trying to steal chickens. Now you put this on. I'll be back in a few minutes to give you a nice warm bath. Bear waited while they got stripes ready for his examination. He was still worried about his friend. Oh, take a deep breath. <gasps> now take another deep breath. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Deeper, as deep as you can. Doc Vet gave Stripes a really thorough checkup. He checked him on all sides. In back, in front, even up and down. What's his problem, Doc? Is he going to live? Quiet. I'm working. Doc Vet wouldn't make a diagnosis before all tests were done. What do you do with that light? It won't hurt him, will it? That's our new X-rated machine. When he stands here like this, the light goes right through him and I can see his insides. I can tell if anything's wrong. Take a look. You can see for yourself. It's incredible, the things modern medicine's coming out with now. For instance, take me. I'm the greatest medical invention going. I always find the problem. Aha! Uh -huh. That's it, I should have guessed. There it was, all right. 
Little Tiger's problems stemmed from a simple slipped stripe. So what now? A minor operation should take care of it. An operation? Just a little one. Nothing to worry about. Uh, he'll be all right, won't he? After the operation, I mean. That's the problem with all you bears, huh? No faith. Why bother coming to a genius like me if you're going to second guess me all the time? Hmm? You want a quack? You go and see Doc Doc down the hall. Hmm? Fine then. Operation it is. Today, okay? Stripes' operation was scheduled right after Foxy's surgery. <laughs> a needle doesn't bother me. Who was he trying to kid? I get needles all the time. <laughs> doesn't hurt. Sure. No pain, <laughs> just a little sting. Huh, Foxy? Well, my friend Stripes here is a whole lot braver than you are. When Foxy was sound asleep, he was wheeled into the operating room. Operation in progress. When he was wheeled back out, Foxy's broken paw was good as new. It was Stripes' turn now, and he was very brave about the whole thing. The needle was the last thing he remembered. When he came to, it was all over and he was completely healed. Good. You're awake. Very good. You're all cured. You go home, huh? Tomorrow. The next day, all of Stripes' friends showed up to take him home. trip. Just another half mile as the crow flies. Hang in there. We'll be home before you know it. You must be starting to get hungry. What would you like to eat, huh? I'll cook it up for you. I'd really love some trout with some almond sauce and parsley. Sorry, Stripes, I'm fresh out. Pick something else. How about some egg noodles with almond sauce and parsley? How about some nice homemade soup? What do you say? My specialty. Terrific! That's what I really want. And that's what they had. Homemade soup with fresh potatoes and fresh carrots from the garden. And as a special treat, fresh parsley, just for stripes. Next time, it'll be my turn. I'll be the one who gets sick and you can take care of me, huh? You bet. I'll take good care of you, Bear. <laughs> oh, I am the bear of the forest here, the forest here, the forest here. And I sing my song, my dear. <clears throat> uh, this next story is, uh, How Lonely is the Air. The day started out gray and rainy. Great weather for ducks, maybe. Or even the odd adventurous worm. But for most people, 
It's a good day for staying in bed. But rain or no rain, it's time for Schnudello to get up. Uh-oh, off to a bad start. Can today be canceled? The day's still young, and already you know things are going to get worse. Stupid hat. Well, your aim's still good. Maybe the day will get better after all. Where'd that shoe go? Come on, think. Don't panic. It has to be around here somewhere. Well, don't ask me what it was doing in there. It's your shoe. Schnoodle Mama's coming. I want you to get me some water down by the river. And don't forget to bring a bucket with you. Shundello's day was already going from bad to worse. Think positive, Shundello. It's going to get better. So, I'm an optimist. There now. What else could go wrong? I don't guess it really is a topsy-turvy day. Just hang in there. The garden needs raking. The lawn needs cutting. And don't take all day. When you're finished with that, there's Schnoodle Sis's hair to do. Then you can drive the worms out of the wooden furniture. <laughs> and don't forget, there's still the berry patch to eat. The ants need to be fed. And Schnoodle Horsey needs honey flowers. Do this, do that. It's enough to drive a Schnoodle boy crazy. Enough is enough. Go ahead, Schnoodello. Leave home. Leave your mother, your father, your sister. Get away from this place. You don't need anybody. Hey, Schnoodle boy, you forgot your hat. But I guess you don't need that either. And I don't need you. Okay. Still, it seems to me you'd want your magic bottle. Or at least the note that makes you a boodle with nothing to fear. I don't need any of it. You got that, mister? Uh, I guess so. Looks like you're on your own now. After a while, Schnudello came to a nice tall tree. It looked like it went right up into the sky. So he took out his trusty rope ladder. He looped the end, looked for a strong branch, and hooked his rope ladder to it. He pulled it up as high as it would go, then started to climb, going higher and higher. And he just kept climbing till he reached the top. Stutello felt like he was on top of the world. Nobody would bother him here, and he was never coming down. He would live up here. He would even die up here. And nobody, but nobody was going to run his life. Nobody was going to tell him what to do. Oh my, look at the view. Why, you can see for miles up here. Schnoodle Boy was running his own life now. Let them get their own water. 
and fix their own hair and tend to their own garden. They needed him a lot more than he needed them. Ah, freedom. No chores, no responsibilities. No one to worry about but himself. Sometimes being alone can get scary. I'm not scared of anything. Come on, Schnudello. Admit it. You're scared. I am not. No. I'm having fun. I'm not scared. I see you're still hanging in there, Schnudello. After the wind died down, things got very quiet. Schnudello clung to the treetop. He'd been up here quite a while, and he was getting pretty hungry. He was getting tired, too, and hotter and hotter. Maybe doing chores wasn't all that bad after all. At home, he could at least cool off in the river. Nighttime came, and the darker it got, the colder it got. At least at home, he had a nice warm bed to sleep in. And his snoodle parents to keep him safe. It's hard to tell if Schnudello's shaking because he's cold or because he's scared. Things look no better in the morning. Was Schnudello so free that he'd spend the rest of his life in a tree? What kind of freedom was that? Hey, look, Schnudello. Look who's coming this way. It's Canary. Canary's come for you. Canary's been looking for you all night. And you thought nobody cared. I found you. Come on, let's go home now. Canary brought Schnudello down from the tree to where Schnudel Horsey was waiting. You've got good friends, Schnudel Boodle. They really care about you. Schnudel Horsey will even let you ride her. Just this once. <laughs> A beautiful raisin cake. A welcome home cake Schnoodle Mama baked just for you, Schnadello. You're a very lucky boy. You've got a magic canary friend. A special Schnoodle horsey. A Schnoodle papa. A Schnoodle mama who bakes raisin cakes. And a Schnoodle sis. See? Not all days are bad. You know the sea. It's great, it's big, and it's blue. Water, water everywhere. That's what the sea's all about. Lots of water as far as the eye can see. It's a great place for sailors and fish. And seahorses, too. In fact, this next story's about a seahorse race underwater. I just love to watch seahorse races. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Uh, okay, now, Red D, a seahorse. Spring returned to the countryside around Popoff's home. And as he did every year in the spring, Popoff sat on the bench outside his house. And he dreamt of far off places.
His daydreams would take him over the forests, the mountains, the rivers, right down to the sea. Hi, matey, and a good morning to you, sir. If I might have a few moments of your valuable time, I have things to show you. A merchant seaman. Souvenirs from your travels? Some exotic treasures? What kind of things? Why have combs from the Orient and shrunken heads from the Amazon? And uh, from the sea? Anything from there? I've never been to the sea. Something from the sea. Just feast your eyes on this. It's the finest shell the sea has to offer. Just hold it up to your ear, matey. And you'll even hear the fish swimming. Try it. I hear the sea. Sold. Pop off bought too. Now Popov could hear the sea in stereo. He could hear the waves come crashing on the beach. He could even hear the fish swimming. But Popov didn't just want to hear the sea. He wanted to see it. So he went inside and he started packing. Popov was going to the sea. Popov had never been anywhere, so he'd never heard of planes. And, since no one had bothered to tell him that only birds could fly, Popov lifted off his old bench and flew off into the unknown. shirt and walked off into the sea. Since no one had bothered to tell him that only fish could live under the sea, he just kept on going. The fish had never seen anything quite like Popoff in their underwater world. The fish must be talking, since its mouth was moving. But Popov couldn't hear him. Maybe if he put the seashells up to his ears, that would help. songs of the sea were strange and beautiful to Popov's ears. So you're a fishy music lover too, I see. Sardine songs are my favorite. Remind me of my home. In Sardinia. Where are you from? Just got in. You look different. What kind of fish are you? A flying fish? Yes, I can fly. Sometimes. Oh, I love everything that flies. I love flies. They taste so good. Oh, dragonflies. Delicious, like big, juicy raisins. Good. Obviously, they weren't talking about the same thing. 
better to change the subject. Know of any good places? Oh, yes. The racetrack. Hurry, there's a big race soon. Seahorses. Exciting, too. The racing event of the year. The fish swam away, and Popoff, who didn't know you had to learn to swim, just swam behind him. Popoff had never been to a seahorse race, and he wasn't going to miss a minute of the excitement. The track was being prepared. The spectators were lining up to get the best view of the action. Popoff and his fishy friend sat side by side. The seahorses were saddled up and raring to go. They whipped the sand with their tails, waiting for the big race to get going. The jockeys were already in the saddle, ready to make sure their mounts raced at a snail's pace. On your mark, get set, stay put. It was a false start. All back to your starting position. Everybody wanted a good view. Isn't this exciting? I just love seahorse racing. Another last minute check as the race master makes sure all horses are accounted for and jockeys are secure on their mounts. words about the rules. Remember, at all times, it's back to front for all. That's rule number one. Bravo! 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 And for rule number two, you go finish line to start with the racers racing backwards, like, um, and as usual, the winner will be the first to reach the finish lap. I, I mean, the starting finish lap. Uh, I mean, the end is the uh, And the winner, the last counted backwards. So the last behind is first in front. Uh, uh, <laughs> the winner is the, the first. But it's the loser who just go! In case you hadn't guessed from the rules, a seahorse race lasted quite a while, but didn't cover too much ground as the entrants did their best to lose in order to win. For two hours, Popoff watched as the snails paced their seahorses over the ten-foot course. The fish encouraged the snail to keep slowing the pace, while a fat seahorse seemed to be gaining on the last place winners. When it came to slowness, no one could keep up with this guy. Exciting stuff, huh? I say fat seal win. Wanna bet, huh? Eight twice, okay? Okay. Okay. And the wager was sealed with a shake of the fin. Giving Fat C something of a no run was this upstart who could run circles right into the loser winner circle if Fat C let him lose enough time. Popoff was thrilled. 
even though the upstart came in second to last, ahead of the fat champion who'd led a losing race to victory from the very last. Round the race is over, the results are in. It was a close one indeed, but the winning loser for the second century is 400 year old Fatsy. Fatsy was proud indeed. He had held on to his title as slowest horse under the sea, and making it official, a kiss from the presenter to the jockey. Bravo! Good show! When Popoff turned to pay his debt to the perch, the perch was gone. Why'd he do that, Popoff wondered. Back home, you say goodbye. Home. Why not? Popoff would have lots to talk about now. And so he started swimming back towards the seashore. <laughs> there was his shirt, right where he'd left it. And since his travels had not yet taught him that only birds could fly, Popoff flapped his arms and flew home. Hi, matey, and a good morning to you, sir. If I might have a few moments of your valuable time, I have things to show you. There's a river that flows through Paris, and on it there's a ship. It's called Pajama Bottoms. Crazy name, you say. Not at all, as you'll see in a moment. Stay with us now, because we're about to present for your entertainment the adventures of the big ship Pajama Bottoms in living color. I know you'll just love this story. Ready? Okay, then. Enjoy. This tiny, tiny boat, believe it or not, is the star of this story. It belonged to a little French girl named Marie. Often Marie would wish her little boat were a lot bigger. Oh, wouldn't it be just wonderful if my little boat could be as big as the nose of Aunt Janine? But it wasn't. In fact, it was half the size. Marie and her Aunt Janine lived together at number five Rue Brebeul in Paris. There's a world-famous river that cuts through Paris. It's called the Seine. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, Aunt Janine would take Marie and her little boat to the bridge overlooking the Seine. Together, they would watch the hundreds of ships down below. Then Aunt Janine would take Marie down the big avenue to the park. In the middle of this park is a lake where people come to sail their miniature boats. Not quite as miniature as Marie's, and a lot more seaworthy. All these boats sail beautifully on the lake, but not Marie's. Three times a week Marie came here to sail her boat, and three times a week her boat refused to sail. Three times a week, week after week. The fact was that Marie's boat was just too small. At half the size of Aunt Janine's nose, it was a wonder you could even see it. But every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, Aunt Janine would take Marie and her tiny boat back to the lake in the park. And she would just sit there and knit while Marie's little boat just sat there and did nothing. Marie got 
got so tired of wishing and so tired of trying that one day she kicked her tiny boat right out of her life. For a while it just lay there off the curb. A dog came sniffing around. But then just kept on going. Then the rain came. The tiny boat found itself being swept up off the pavement, down the manhole, and into the sewers. The current just carried him along. Suddenly, the little boat was poured out into an even bigger sewer. And before you knew it, there he was, being cast adrift in the Seine itself. When the rain stopped, the sun came out again, and there to enjoy it by the Seine sat Poopool and Pomidor. Pomidor. Our ship has come in. We better catch it this time. I'll be the c captain, and you'll be the crew. When you've had too much to drink, things can become larger than life. And for Pupool, the little boat became a big ship. Get down here, Pomidor. I'm going to need your help here. And fast, it's an order. An order is an order, so Pomodoro joined his captain on the deck, and together they watched as their tiny ship grew ready to take them away on a magical cruise. What a fantastic ship! What a fantastic journey lay ahead! Captain Pupool and his crew watched as their ship grew readier and readier. Finally, it was time to put it back into the same. By the time the tiny boat hit the water, it had grown into the biggest, most beautiful ship in Paris. Time to cast off. All hands aboard! As the captain of this great green ship, I order you to carry me aboard, sailor. Aye, aye. And Pomodor followed his captain's orders. Next, sailor Pomodor, you go ashore. I want you to go out and invite all of Paris back to our ship. Got that? Aye, aye. And off he went. He invited everyone he saw to come on board. Come aboard for the captain's tour. Captain Poopool and his crew want to celebrate the ship's christening with you. I promise it'll be the party of the year. Come drink and be merry. From the looks of it, Everyone in Paris accepted Captain Poopool's invitation. Everybody came, even Aunt Janine and Marie. danced. Aunt Janine danced with the grocer. They danced on deck. They danced below deck. Everyone was having a good time. Everyone except Marie. What a nice ship. Why couldn't I have one like this? Now that would be a wish come true. I now christen this great green ship, the good ship, Pyjama Bottoms. Hooray! 
Parisians went ashore and headed back to their own homes. Okay, sailor Pomidor, raise the anchor, then start the engines. We set sail for Pijama. Panama, that's pa na ma, my friend. Panama, Pijama, just do it. And the good ship Pajama Bottoms set sail for Papool's Pajama Canal.